That's right, you are now listening to Tommy Tom's One Mic. Warning, this podcast contains explicit language, triggering or sensitive topics, and controversial discussions. Thank you so much for tuning in to Tommy Tom's One Mic. I'm Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, flip personality, you know it's I. You never see my kind, never seen a fucking sliver or a slice. I'm the butcher, choice cuts, know I'm nice. You got beef? I got waggle with a knife. Now I'm gonna be wrapping up bodies up at night. Like Ray Charles, y'all know I'm out of sight. Now I'm gonna be slaying this, cause you know I love the life. Yo, you gotta read between the lines. I'm only gonna be moving when I'm read through all the signs. Johnny Mnemonic, I got an upgrade in mind. This is for the rebels and the revolutionary minds. Cybernetic linguistics, you know I'm on my mind. Prototype the new dimension, man, that shit is mine. Future is creation and creation is sublime. Make your own legend, only happens with time. Let's hit the mic. Hey guys, welcome back to Tommy Tom and One Mic. And today, I'm going back to the past. I'm going back to my college years, my end of my teenagers, into my 20s. And when I went to college, I decided I was going to be a writer. I had these dreams, these ideas. And along the way, I bumped into this random girl who, for some reason, I saw in every one of my classes. We had the exact same schedule and everything. And I quickly formed a friendship with this person. I give her many nicknames. One, of course, being my favorite alcoholic. uh, What what was it? The dwarf in the fridge. (laughs) The The Keebler Elf of Beer. (laughs) The Keebler Elf of Beer. And as I was saying to her before, so glad she got married so I don't have to butcher her her original last name. So, (laughs) folks, Miss Christine Carpenter. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, Christine. As I was saying, long time no see. It's uh, been a while. I think the last time I probably saw you was like some random Cortica that I think you guys just came up and it was like real brief and you probably have very few uh, memories. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, not so sure. Um, I, I remember the whole Cortica but thing, but I know it's showing up in uh, snippets up here, a montage of, uh, of very drunk call- moments. We, we call it, me and my friends call it time travel. There's like little brief time travel uh-huh. things. It's like, I didn't black out. I was still going. <laughs> right. You know, black out, I think you, Pat, you're, you're done. The night's done. If you're still right. going, you're just, you're going through time. Yeah, I had, um, I had a lot of those, but no. those nights and days, unfortunately. <laughs> I think we all did. You know, Cortica wasn't just like a one night thing. I think it was, at least for me and my friends, it was just like a phrase. We were just like, if we went out and we were drinking, it was just like, yo, Cortica Wu, that's it. (laughs) Just (laughs) whatever happened, happened after that. (laughs) What football game? I I, I joke on stage sometimes, like I went to uh, college for writing and I uh, graduated with a master's in alcoholism. I, uh, yeah, you and me both. (laughs) Oh, the wild times. But no, we are both in the professional writing, I guess you say major, at uh, SUNY Cortland. I think there was only one other person in our grade. I think it was Jeannie. Mm -hmm. I know she went into English and whatnot. But no, like I said, we had every class together. So, you know, it made it easier for whenever uh, one of us had a hangover or something uh, that, hey, I I can't make class. Do you have the notes from that (laughs) and whatnot? You know, uh, you know, I made, I made, that was like one of the few years I made Dean's list and I credit that partially to you in that way. It was just like <laughs> a team thing. I'm <laughs> just like, oh, I don't have to worry. And then like, you know, after, you know, you weren't there. So it was like, oh man, now I don't have, I don't have a backup plan if I don't do this, do the shit. I just I remember I that first it. week of classes going through and being like, oh, you again. Oh, okay. You again, you again. And I don't think like, that's how drunk I think I was that first, like, I don't think I pieced it together that we were like, I was like, oh wait, it's you again. <laughs> like, <laughs> it took me quite a long time to realize like, and, and then what did they call it? It was like the digital learning community. Right. And yes. there were, there were a few of us, but not everybody in exactly you and I had the exact same schedule. Didn't we? Yeah, or did you have any to... other classes without me? I don't think so. No. I like we had like the core classes that we all had to take, Mm -hmm. but then there were the deviants where we actually had to choose a class or something like a specific writing class or something like that. And we had it with a, I forget her name. I feel bad. I know exactly who you're talking about. 
one chick who was definitely a townie who knew all about the drinking and partying and had had her time and fun too. So I loved her and I can't think of her name either. Because I think we took poetry the following semester together. Yep. I was going to say that. Yep. Yep. I remember yeah. her in poetry and then I, it was like a general um, writing class, I think. Was it a creative yeah. writing class the first semester? Something like that. But I really liked her too. Yeah, she definitely got it. <laughs> But no, it was, uh, you know, it was a familiar face that I always see and occasionally bump into on the streets, uh, walking, mm-hmm. getting pizza. I believe uh, I might use that as uh, the thumbnail for it of the, the running into each other. I'm going, I, was it Clayton? Going up Clayton. Yep. And then you guys coming down. And I think I got some pizza from someplace or something. I'm just standing there and it's like, it's clear. It's clear we we're all in a good place, I guess. That's mm, that point in time. At 15 minutes prior, I was asleep on top of the pizza. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I may have, I don't know if you ever deleted it. I may have saved it just for my own personal entertainment. The picture of you in the fridge with uh, the jello shots and the beer. I will never delete that picture ever. <laughs> ever. That is yeah. my essence. <laughs> you have to stay proud of that. That was a <laughs> key moment. I was yeah, like, I thought I could perfect. fit in the fridge. I remember you were like so excited when you were telling me about it. It's like, yeah, so I found out I could fit in the fridge. It was a very big moment. Yeah. <laughs> the excitement. Oh my God. That was funny. But what like what what got you into choosing professional writing? Like I know for myself, I had always been in love with writing since I was like in elementary school and whatnot. That was like my big thing. We would have these scenes called Reader's Theater where we'd write a story and we tell it in front of like uh, the auditorium and shit, which is kind of what I'm doing now. So it's like I've mm-hmm. gone full circle in a sense of what I like to do. But I'm always curious as to, because it's clear you have a love for writing, but I wonder what made you decide to go like that professional writing route, I guess you could say. I think it also stems back from when I was a kid. It's funny, somebody recently asked me uh, uh, the same question and I, I thought about it. And I think that elementary school too, we, we would print up these little stories we'd write our little stories and then there'd be like the publishing house and it was a classroom and they would print it and bind your book and then you got to illustrate it and I would I was always the kid that as soon as that book was hot off the you know the little printer I was online again you know to get my next story in and I think about that and how I've taken all these different directions and I've always kind of been drawn back to writing and um, I initially left because I was like I'm not going to make any money with this this isn't what I want to do you know like I I, I had you know uh, what do they call it a champagne taste with a beer budget so I had to yeah that's me so (laughs) so (laughs) I thought like I have to go into an industry where I'm going to make some money and you know and I did that for a while and it's just funny it's it's kind of that thing that always pulls me pulls me back you know and it's it's at the root of who I am and what I love to do and I I don't know if it's from being read to so much as a child or what but I've I've always just been passionate about about writing so I think the thing also uh I guess now in like retrospect looking back uh because I told you kind of like I got kind of bored with uh the professional writing program and I kind of transitioned into communications where The funny thing for me, I actually had more fun in the communications major uh, just because most of the kids in communications hated writing. So everyone wanted to partner with me when we had to do scripts or uh, mapping out storylines or something when we were trying to uh, record something. Mm -hmm. So really, it's like you're at an advantage already if you enjoy writing and you don't mind doing that when you go into that field. And stuff. That's so. interesting. I would never, I wouldn't think, I would think that the communications majors would, would have been lovers of writing. So that's, that's interesting. I mean, they're significantly better at the editing and all this other stuff and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe that was the point of like, I don't, I think we were the only, I think we were the only year of the digital living community. I don't know if it like continued. Really? After. Yeah. Cause I know one of the main guys, not Vanderveer, uh, the guy, because he was the first guy I met, which ultimately made me go there, uh, mm-hmm. go to Cortland. Uh, he was kind of the head guy, like, planning out this thing. And I think okay. from what, like, you know, once again, retrospect, looking back, 
the idea was you get all these people in these majors that generally work together, have them just like pick up on the skills and learn about the whole teamwork that ultimately they want to try and do or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like Dave was a straight communications major. And when he had scripts or something, he would have me just edit them to check them out for him and stuff like that on the side. And Dave openly said, and Dave's uh, worked for Viacom and stuff like that. He's gone on and done stuff. And he's like, I credit you a lot for helping me graduate because I hated writing. (laughs) I didn't want to do it. So when I wrote something, you just come, I knew I could send it to you to just like go over it and not so much do it for me, but like point me in the direction of how I should write it out. So there's a, you know, those advantages, but I guess the main point I was trying to make before that detour was that (laughs) I think the ultimate thing for me was like, like you were talking about going into an industry that could make you money because when you think about it, the writing route was like, how am I going to make money at this and stuff? And I think that was the thought process for me that like, I want to say, I don't want to say resentful, but almost like kind of turned off at writing a little bit. Mm -hmm. I guess it goes to that phrase, like, don't do what you love for money so much. Yeah, yeah. So when you start turning it that way, it kind of sours and you kind of neglect it and stuff. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, I mean, who was to say that I couldn't make money writing? That was my thought. Pro- you know, that was, mm-hmm. I, I had wanted to go to Marist initially. I didn't get in. Um, and I kind of had it in my mind that I was going to transfer you know, and get my gen ed classes out of the way. And, but when I got to Cortland, I, you know, I wasn't sure. And um, I had heard that the, the fashion department um, at Marist placed, I think 97% of their graduates in, in jobs within, I don't know how many months, it was a short time period. And I was like, okay, like, that's what I want. I, I, for some reason, and it's so funny, like I wanted like that, you know, insurance, but, you know, I, and I loved it in the beginning and then it just stopped being, you know, satisfying. It, 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 the business totally changed. Um, you know, as retail is a mess right now. Um, and it was headed in that direction pre COVID pre, you know, anyway. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's funny that, and now I'm trying to make money writing. So it's like, it's funny how it just totally changed. Yeah. It's like I said, that full circle kind of thing that you do sometimes, you know, I don't, I don't think I ever told you this, like, I had in my mind also like in that first year, and this this might be the crazy thing, right? And I will admit I'm crazy. But I was like, if anything ever happens, I want Christine to have all my my story ideas because I think she could do it. It was like this weird like thing. I love it. Me. I was like, I have all these, I, like my friends make fun of me that have actually seen it. My whole iTunes, I have broken into playlists of all these like story ideas that I would like to do just for music like playlists that I can listen to and stuff and that's the like motivation I guess when I'm actually doing something like that and I've been doing that since college so it's and I always have to update it every so often and I'm like I have like over almost 8,000 songs of iTunes that I've just broken into and it's like I can't repeat the song it's like some serious OCD where it's like I can't (laughs) replay I can't I can't have repeat song it can be repeat if it's like from a different artist or something like that, but I can't have the same song in there. So it's like, it's a task, <laughs> I guess you could say, but that's, that's my OCD with it. But mine is my notes app, but mine is just like scribblings of random. I call them my serial killer notes because I usually <laughs> write them in the middle of the night when I wake up and then in the morning, most of it makes no sense, <laughs> but it's like the ideas that come. I, I, the- I like, and I must have, I have hundreds and hundreds of notes that and I go back to decipher them and I'm like, oh my God, what was I talking about? You know? Yeah. See, this is why I was like, you know what? I feel like Christine could take my, <laughs> I'll give them, <laughs> like something happens to me. I'm going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> what was like your uh, favorite type of writing? I guess. Did you like the storytelling or poetry or stuff like that? What was like, I guess would say be your, your strong point in writing? It's funny. I, I always liked storytelling and now I've gotten much more into poetry and I don't, I didn't even know that what I was writing was poetry. And then I started, you know, sharing it on social media and stuff. And, you know, people started, you know, sharing it among their communities and stuff. And I'm, I'm going like, Oh my God, like this is, this is poetry, I guess. I know nothing about poetry, but just kind Mm -hmm. of reverse, you know, 
writing. And um, now what I'm doing is more um, what's happened, you know, in the last year, you know, having a baby in the middle of a pandemic, mm. um, having really, really bad um, depression and anxiety when I was pregnant and kind of navigating that um, what with what felt like blindly. And when we talk about alcohol and we, you know, we laugh and whatever, but, um, mm. you know, not having that, not having that as a, as a crutch during pregnancy. I mean, that was, that was how I dealt with it. I would come home from, you know, from work and I'd have a couple glasses of wine. And, and now I, you know, I was cut off from that, um, being pregnant and kind of like very lost. And so now I'm kind of making it my mission to create some type of resource for other pregnant women, um, that, you know, may be suffering and suffering in silence, because I think there's this whole, like, diaper ad dream you know mm. that I like to call where people are oh, I'm so excited and you know people would stop me on the street when I was pregnant and I was, oh you look so cute are you excited and I and I'd be like yeah I'm excited and inside I was like no I'm in hell I'm you know I'm in mm. hell I, I'm I'm scared out of my mind I hate this um I don't know what I'm gonna do with my life um and I was so afraid of the change and and of everything and you know so that's really, you know, I guess being in pain and I, you know, that's why they call us tortured artists, um, being in pain brought that out again, you know, brought that, brought me back into, to writing and, and kind of brought me back into a point where I was like, Oh, what am I doing? You know, rushing into the city every day. And I was telling you before I had a four, four hour commute it was two yeah. hours each way. And it was insane, you know, and I, I, I did it and there, you know, I loved it. I took up knitting. I, I was doing all kinds of stuff, things. I was reading. I was. No, I, I, I saw you would like post a lot of uh, your knittings on there. You like, you, mm -hmm. do you have like an uh, Etsy or something? I do. I don't sell the knitting uh, pieces because it doesn't, it's not fruitful. And I like to knit for myself. I don't really like to knit to sell, but I've sold patterns. I've written my own patterns and stuff and sold mm -hmm. those. So that's cool. Um, but it's been, it was more of like a pleasure thing more for me but it was also it was how I navigated anxiety and how I navigated my commute and because I used to have panic attacks on the train going in so I had to do oh. something yeah and that's how I, I would I would get so fidgety and I had to do something with my hands and so that's that's really where it started no I get that that's uh I think that's ultimately what there are a number of things that ended up uh probably fucking up my college uh career was uh I think sophomore year I had like really the only real anxiety attack I ever had, like I couldn't breathe or anything sitting in the back of my friend's car. And then like after that, like you in like uh, New Big, as you would know, uh, the cafeteria and all that, I had to have like a wall behind me because I get kind of skittish if people walk behind me or something like that. And it was like mm. crippled, like probably for a while. And, you know, I used the crutch of alcohol myself and all yeah. that and it took you know me fucking up a bunch and having to go to rehab and just that time in rehab I do credit a lot for <clears throat> I guess where I'm at now in the sense that I never said I was gonna like stop or anything like that it's just that I needed a pause to like kind of regroup and refocus myself yeah. and just get back into that creative thing and like I said once you're at that point that's when I started writing again and doing stories and stuff like that so I'd always have a notebook with me because mm -hmm. sometimes you know the rehab classes when you're inpatient are all the same and I generally left me alone so I'd just be sitting there writing because mm -hmm. you know as long as I wasn't doing drugs or drinking you know I was fine right no I, I I've always found it as like a, a cathartic thing but I do think like when you when you hit that you know I don't want to call it rock bottom but when you when you're mm -hmm. in that hell you know that mental hell um, sometimes it brings forth a lot of nice ideas too. <laughs> so. you, go, you go through, you go through lows and all that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to hit a certain low to just kind of, kind of wake up in a sense mm -hmm. of just being like, I can't stay in this. I can't, I can't keep on playing this game. I gotta get myself out <clears throat> and, you know, the creativity. I usually told people, it's like, just find something to do. Like definitely during the pandemic, you get a lot of people. I think a lot of people ended up uh, finding out that they're depressed during uh, 2020. When oh, yeah. A lot of people reflecting on life and shit. So pretty much my advice to them every time uh, was like, do something. You, you're just sitting around complaining about everything and you're not moving. You're not 
doing something that try and find some positive. Mm-hmm. That's all you can do. Or you right. can just still stay in the muck. Right. And it's easy to when everything is, you know, everything is stopped. It's like, it's mm-hmm. so easy to, st- to get stuck. I mean, I, it's funny. I found that time. I was so grateful because I was so big and so pregnant <laughs> when the world shut down. I was like, oh, I don't have to get on the train. You know, I was lugging my, my body down Fifth Avenue and uh, it was, it was tough, but it, I, it also like, I kind of threw myself into my job at home and I would sit in front of the computer for eight hours and, and my husband Doug was he was like take a break you know like he's like I've never seen you work this hard but I was so anxious and I had so much you know so much time to think that I said I nope I'm just gonna I'm gonna pour my energies into into my I don't think I ever worked so hard as those last few months and then mm. I ended up leaving uh but but I needed it you know it was like you, you talk about do something I I I really did it <laughs> I went I went full throttle because what, what did we have we were we were home and we have I we live in a a condo and so there's like 15 other units it's very small and there's just this circle and we I just remember every day just like walking the circle on the walk I like the hamster wheel like, mm. you know and and you could go crazy you and, oh, yeah. and a lot of people did you know and you, but I I had to the same way immerse yourself in in your work oh yeah because <laughs> oh man like as soon as I found stand up and then the pandemic came, I was like, I gotta still do stuff. And I've had this like podcast idea in my mind for a while, but it's always mm-hmm. like I didn't have the confidence to just start it and do it myself. But definitely through getting out of that muck, I was like, I'll just finally just do it. Cause that's what I always tell people, just do something. Uh so mm-hmm. can't be a hypocrite anymore. You think yeah. of like you think of like all the times we growing up you tell people hey this is what you should do or something like that but you yourself weren't doing the shit either so yeah it's easy you know, to, it's easy to it's dole like out the advice <laughs> yeah it's like no no i see what you're doing wrong this is what you're <laughs> realizing that you've like become your parents without even realizing it oh, at yeah, times for sure Reflections. but you were you were only in Portland for a year then you transferred to maris like you said because you saw the uh I guess, success rate into getting into a career after, mm-hmm. which I think is a justifiable thing. I mean, I, I say, like, other than my friend Dave, who you know uh, from Cortland also, uh, yeah. I don't know really anybody that's actually using their major, like what they went to school for and anything. They're doing whatever they can, essentially. And it's funny, at Marist, I would say 99% of my friends use their major um really which is nuts yeah and and that's what I saw but it's just I look back on it and it's funny how that's that's where my mind was you know and that's what was important mm-hmm. and I'm just kind of yo-yoing back to you know I was never home I was always working I was always out and now I'm home all the time you know like I used to I said it simply like I I remember just rushing and towards the end, the last few years of working being like, oh, I just want to drink my fucking coffee in a regular mug and a real mug. That's all I want. I just want to like one morning because I'm, I'm leaving early. I'm coming home late, you know, and mm-hmm. now it's funny. Like I, I, I'm, you know, I'm home with my son and he's 14 months old and I'm, I, I'm like, I just want a travel mug. <laughs> <laughs> like I just want to get out of the house <laughs> you know but the grass so is always greener but but no I, I I I love I'm a homebody so this is like I mean this is a homebody on steroids after being going yeah. through a pandemic and then being a being a stay-at-home mother being or being a mother is like being in quarantine the first six weeks anyway like it, you just you can't leave the house there's nowhere to go um but especially with all this and all the fear and whatever um so it's just funny like how it shifted completely yeah I mean you had mentioned that uh you were still trapped you're still going to work while you're pregnant too right like yeah I went until March 12th or 13th whenever the, the World Health Organization declared COVID a pandemic and I went to work the next day <laughs> I was like, and I was laughing at my desk. I was drinking my, you know, my decaf Americano. And I was talking to my, I was like, the people are crazy. This is nothing. Like we were laughing about it. We didn't take it seriously at all. And that day on the train, there was nobody, you know? And I was just like, and everybody was so mad at me, you know, at, at, like, what are you still doing? What where are you still going in? And I, I don't know. We just didn't, we didn't take it seriously. I, I don't know if it was 
the nature of my boss or my job or what I mean I we thought nothing of it I mean my boss came in with a face shield and we were laughing like we were like this is so nuts the world's gone crazy and then then we took um a long weekend and she was like oh it's not because of the pandemic it's just because let's just take a long weekend and I never went back you know Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to go back in September and just I I couldn't do it I I couldn't do it anymore I I, first of all I wanted to be home I didn't want to be I didn't want to do the daycare thing I didn't want to miss out on um because I was I was so I'm so inspired too by the whole process of going through the you know this depression and you know then having Mm -hmm. it was instant relief when I had my son you know I was it was instant relief I, it, it I say it all the time it wasn't love at first sight it was relief at first sight I was so relieved that it was over <laughs> and it's not a, you know it's not talked about that you know that kind of that kind of d- depression or fear it's it's all like oh you must be so excited like I was saying and I wasn't what gets underrated maybe sometimes with women getting pregnant is that that is the whole life change like you said you you're not working now and all that. I know plenty of women that they had their careers and as soon as they had the kid, that went to the side because this is a new focus. Mm-hmm. So it's a, you know, you see guys complaining or like worrying or stressing all that, but it's like, yeah, yeah and I'm not trying to be some woke bitch when I say it, but I mean, like, <laughs> it is true that like, it's, it's a definite change for women in the sense that like, no, this is a much bigger undertaking because you're, carrying it and there's always this fear and worry or something like that of the probably in the past the present and the future at all times it's just like yeah what's this kid gonna see what 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 am i doing this right right oh my god what if i'm a horrible mother and all this other stuff that just is yeah. going to be a constant whirlwind in your head that play those plaguing thoughts and then and it's i had friends deal with like postpartum depression and all this stuff and i would like I had none of that. And they were like, Oh my God, like, how did you nab? Because I went, I don't you remember, you know, like I, I went through it. I just went through it on the opposite side. I, you know, I was, I was like elated. I was so, so relieved. And it was so everything I could felt I could handle anything. What once he was here before he was here, it was all on, it was much more unknown to me, which is weird. It seems like the opposite of um what a lot of people experience but I'm like there has to be like a silent group that you know a group that just suffers in silence because this is not talked about you know at all so I I that's kind of where I I feel so passionate too about writing because it's it's you it's a way to reach people um who are suffering too I think in in so many ways you you can you know you can touch someone by your own story I think uh probably the other thing also just from my own experience, I think I can, I can write my ideas so much more clearly than sometimes I can say or articulate. Like, oh yeah. My, my, the words in my brain go a lot faster and they make so much more sense in my head. And then when it comes out, it's just, it's just like <laughs> dribble sometimes. So it's like, I think you're not so giving yourself sense. enough credit though. Let's face it. Look what so you're doing. Yeah. And it's like, uh, <laughs> maybe I should write this out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know what you mean though. It's, it's, that's what I was saying to you before. I was like, God, I hope I don't stumble over my words when we, when we do this, because I'm, I'm so not, I don't consider myself articulate, but if you put me, you know, in front of my laptop or with a notebook and I, I'm much, much more powerful. Can we do a podcast just with messenger or something? <laughs> <laughs> just have all, that's Bubbles what, coming up. Like a, Maybe Where? that'll be the next, but like when I go into YouTube and all that, I'll just post the message boards as they go back and forth. There we go. I love that. Nice there you go. <laughs> I would shine at that. <laughs> Much safer. <laughs> but Christine, we have reached the halfway point. So okay. we're going to take a little break. And okay. uh, when we come back, we'll get a little more into uh, how life is going with you. Maybe a little more about this fashion industry, because I'm curious as to what it is that you actually did in there because I know you work with retail and all that and I remember just like a few conversations when you were in Maris because we had message every now and then so Mm -hmm. we'll get into that but we'll be right back after this welcome back once again it's Tommy Tom and I am here with my freshman year college homie buddy friend 
Miss Christine Carpenter, you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it brings me still joy that I don't have to say that other name. <laughs> but by curiosity, how do you actually pronounce that name? <laughs> Ergola. Ergola. See, it sounds so much simpler when you say it like that. Mm -hmm. But just looking at it, it was intimidating. <laughs> I used to get arugula or gugula. I used to get so many different uh, renditions. Carpenter is much easier. People still ask me how to spell it, um, but <laughs> but um, but it's much much easier. Jeez. <laughs> but no, uh, as we were talking before the break, you know, I was curious as to what you actually. Uh, did in the fancy, uh, why well, I was about to say fancy industry, fashion <laughs> industry, it's still fancy. Uh, <laughs> because I know when you left, we'd occasionally like message with each other on, I want to say I messenger. Probably. What, what was the, they like shut aim. We used to message on aim. Wow. We're yeah. really dating ourselves. I just realized yeah. that <laughs> before, before they shut down aim, we would message every now and then. Just to check mm -hmm. up and whatnot. I had to see uh, how you're doing, and I knew you were doing the fashion and all that. How was that process? I guess because you did like ten years. Yeah, I um I actually interned for a company when I was at Marist, and then I ended up working part time, and then they hired me. Um, but I worked for a very small operation. Uh, it was myself and my boss, and um, that's why leaving was such a tough thing. But I, it was a wholesale business and it was handbags and belts. So um, everybody who, when you tell anybody you're in the fashion industry, they go, oh, you're a buyer. And I, no, I was the vendor. I was on the opposite end. So I would sell to the retail stores. So, you know, big stores would come in and they would say, oh, we like, you know, this, this, and this, but we want you to change this buckle and this hardware and this fabric or this leather and we want it in this color and they would make all the decisions and you would, you know, you would have some creative input and then I would go back and I did product development and sales. Um, so I would, you know, I would essentially do some designing and development and then we would present it to buyers and they'd either take it off the line or they'd make their changes. And um, then I would go back, I would work with um, factories in China and Italy. And I would say, Hey, this is what our customer wants. We have to put their label inside. And because it was, it was all private label pretty much. And, um, and I would, you know, get samples from the factories and I would timeline everything. And then I would work with them on a production schedule and I would actually ship it out too. So I dealt with like shipping the containers of merchandise and everything from, from start to finish. So it was great. It was great experience. I loved it. I loved, you know, the energy. I loved seeing the concepts from like inception to delivery, the whole, the whole, the whole, um, process and yeah that. yeah exactly and so I that was great um it was a great experience and then um in the last couple of years I you know the industry changed Amazon changed things um mm -hmm. and and retail struggled and I I started to fall out of love with it but I wasn't really honest my, with myself about it I just kind of kept going and you know I was like I don't want to be this person who is you know only in it when it's successful and I wanted to make it happen and I just we just couldn't we couldn't do it and then um you know COVID hit and I was I was home at about seven months pregnant and I was trying to get new accounts and everybody was like why are you calling me we're closed just like mm -hmm. everybody else have you turned on the news and I still I, I, I came up with an account list and I was going to try and go after when I came back from you know from my leave and I realized about two months in that I, after my son was born, that I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And that was, that was the end of it. So, um, but I loved, I had such a good Ooh. experience in the fashion industry. It, it, you know, the apparel is much more cutthroat. I found that the accessories business to be very sweet and small. Everybody kind of knew everybody. Um, even now I was in, um, I was in Cape Cod with my family on vacation and I, ran into this guy that I knew for, at one of the like flea markets there and I was like oh I bought a bag from you years ago and I said I used to work in the industry and he was like oh where did you work and we knew all the same people and you would think like you would think it would be a huge huge industry but accessories were always smaller and sweeter and I loved that about it um because I wouldn't have survived in a in a you know a cutthroat kind of thing I, I would have 
I already like a coward when like a buyer came in, I would be so nervous <laughs> to, <laughs> to sell and, and all that. So um, yeah, it was great. It, I mean, it was a great, great time. It just, it kind of ran its course, you know, life changed. No, I mean, it makes sense. Like from my conversation with uh, Dana, I believe she was more in apparel because I know okay. she transitioned from that into modeling and stuff like that, which is oh, wow. a whole nother adam, uh, a whole nother animal. But you know, uh, uh, one of my gay moments, you know, uh, throughout college, I watched uh, Project uh, Runway. That was my show. That was my guilty pleasure show. And all I that. love that. I didn't know this about you. Yeah, that's probably I'm, why I was always curious what you're doing. <laughs> I'm psyched to, know, to learn this. I used to love that show. <laughs> yes, you know, I've moved on to classier things, you know, uh, for my, my trash television, I watched Jersey Shore. I can't help Perfect. it. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I was always like curious, uh, just the process. I just, I found it uh, so intriguing, I guess you could say, just uh, the process of designing and doing all that I could never do it like drawing that was like that was probably why I really went into writing it's because like everybody loved to draw and I suck at drawing so it's just like this is my lane I'm gonna stick with my lane I'll, I'll yeah, paint a picture with my words right <laughs> it's it, that's it's funny I fashion was always kind of in my in my bones too my I mean going way back my my grandparents they worked in a um factory my grandfather was a master dress cutter and my grandmother was a seamstress and then on the other side my great great aunt ran an embroidery business um where she used to embroider um all the movie stars coats they would come in with their fur coats they had an armed guard at the door and they would embroider their names into their coat that was like the thing so I always say it's in my blood and I love it and I still you know I still definitely with knitting and with all the other you know, passions that I have. I still enjoy it. But my fa I, when I tell people now that I was in the fashion industry, they probably look at me like I'm nuts because every day is like sweatpants, you know, spit up stained <laughs> shirts. And it's not like, uh, not very fashionable these days, but I do, uh, I do, I definitely still have a passion for it. It just, it, it shifted for sure. That's, maybe that's your next lane. You have to develop a fancy mom wear or yeah. stuff that like, like a fold over <laughs> pot, like a thing that would come over. <laughs> That you just like whip back after you're done. <laughs> after your kid throws looks, up all over you. Still looks cheap. Yeah. <laughs> still looks cheap. Or it's detachable. You like, uh, what is it, Jinko jeans or something? How they have the oh zipper there? Oh my God. Remember Jinko like jeans? <laughs> I wore Jinko jeans. You just have like some fancy design or something that they can just remove or something. There you go. <laughs> I won't even ask for a cut. All right. That's I'll how credit you. <laughs> Otherwise, I have your stories to fall back on. That's it. That's right. When I'm gone, <laughs> I don't think you know what you're stepping into. You I don't think. think I do either. So, you know, you'll be set. You'll be busy for life. There you go. You can, you can dive into that. <laughs> Give me something to do. <laughs> no, it's fun. Like, sometimes I like wonder if you did say like what classes I, I would have probably, we probably both would have taken children's literature together. I could have mm -hmm. seen that happening. Uh, mm -hmm. For sure. <laughs> I was, that was a fun class. Like, I think the end thing was uh, you had to write a children's book. That was. Uh, oh, yeah. I would have loved that. I have a friend who's an aspiring children's book author, and I, we were like brainstorming ideas and stuff. And I was like, oh, God, I love that. Like, why am I not doing this? <laughs> this is like fun. That, that, is, that is a parent thing, because I know my friend Hudson has been like, hey, do you think you could help me like create a uh, children's book and all that? Like, he's created his own page with his kid on Instagram. The adventure. He's like, I just want to make it Matt and Nat. The adventures of Matt and Nat. Because his daughter's oh, name is Nat. Cute. I think parenthood also changed. Like a lot of people, I see a new motivation when they have their kid or something. I don't know what that is. Maybe you have something that you could come up with that. But I, it's just something I've noticed with a lot of my friends that have kids. That it's like, I, I think the one that's got to stay home. Usually, that's when the creative thing just bursts. Like maybe they were reserved before, but now that they're home they're like I have all these things I want to let out and share yeah I mean at the risk of sounding like very cliche I mean it is such a it's so transformative and I feel like you know at the risk of sounding very self-centered too I, I mean you look at this like little person and you're like oh my god I need you like and you're like I can do anything but 
but it is in a way like you know you and you, you're watching them grow and like you're watching them like I'm, my son is learning how to speak now it's so funny like he, he, I see him like staring at my lips and I see him and it's it's inspiring you know that there's no no question it's totally inspires me and I see like how he tries new things without hesitation and how I, I'm always you know I relate to how I'm always anxious you know when things change and I have I go through like you know oh I, I'm not a good um I don't do well with change and uh and how you know it's so how really the natural state of being is to just put one foot in front of the other and to try and and he's not afraid to fall you know he's not afraid and it's definitely inspiring to see that that innocence and and to want to create from it did you like to read I know it sounds like a random thing yeah that was like something I had a hard time doing a lot of like I was not it had to be a it had to be a good story for me to actually want to read it or something. Yeah. Like for projects or something. Like I probably grew up, I think I think most of us, most most kids our age, they grew up with goosebumps. Mm-hmm. And I gravitated to those so much, not so much for the horror aspect, but just for the fact that it's like there's gonna be a twist. He was Shyamalan before M. Night Shyamalan was a thing. Okay. Yes. He, uh, I read goosebumps too. I love them always that little twist and that was always something that like intrigued me and sometimes with stories that writer side kicks in and I guess at the risk of me sign- sounding as egotistical sometimes I would just like start I was like oh, okay this is where this story is going to go or something yeah. like that I have to you have to give me more or something and it's like oh it's going to be one of these okay no if I can't do it then my interest just like fades mm-hmm. and stuff yeah it's funny you know somebody said to me recently like you can't you can't be writing without unless you're reading a lot of what you're you know the the sort of the um the genre of what mm. you're writing and I don't really like to I mean I, I read a lot but I like to read fiction and what I'm writing now is nonfiction. so it's mm-hmm. funny how like it, I almost need a mental break um from what I'm producing and I find that reading fiction makes me a better writer I can relate to that. I think it's uh, that thing of uh, it's too much of what you want to do. If you're like mm-hmm. just reading everything in that same genre or vein or something like, and plus maybe that just like helps with my inspiration. You get inspiration from what you get inspiration from. So like right. for you, the nonfiction, it's just like, that's what I like. That's putting you in a clear state of mind, I guess you could say, so that then your imagination can go off. Right. And I think it's like also it's needing to separate, you know, when, when you're home and you're doing, you know, working from home, which I still don't really call what I'm doing working because I'm not being paid for it, <laughs> but, mm-hmm. um, but it is work in a way. So it's like, it's needing that mental, like you said, that mental break and kind of uh, sometimes I just, I'm reading something and I'm like, oh, look at that like sentence structure. And I'm like, just read, just enjoy what you're reading and stop, mm-hmm. turn the brain off. But it does, it, it, you know, it, it, it inspires me to just to read in general. Re- and I, now I read constantly because, if, you know, if I have to put my son to sleep or whatever and I'm with him and I, I have my book light, I feel like a little kid again. Like I'm in bed with my book light <laughs> reading. Um, do you get like uh, feedback from your writing or something from uh, not even like fans, just like, I don't know, people that like would critique or something. Have you ever like gotten something like that? Not so much like a teacher or something, just like you send something in and you get like a review or something like that. Yeah. So actually I'm, what kind of sparked this was I was like feeling lost. I was, I left my job with no prospects, no nothing. Um, and I knew I needed more than just being home and taking care of my son. So I joined this, um, this writing group online. And so they, I send in a piece, you get like one free expert review per month. And I always try and send in something once a month just to get feedback on it. But there's also like community and I connected with one other um, writer and she and I will trade stories and we'll, we'll read each other's stuff and we'll get feedback. And it's great because it's somebody, her style is so different than mine. And we submit to a lot of the same places for publication, but um, we end up having, you know, such different outlooks on on each other's work and, you know, asking, even sometimes she'll just ask me questions and I'm like, oh, right. Like, you know, you weren't here for me for this. I have to fill you Mm -hmm. in on that. You know, I have to fill that in. That's a gap and that that could, you know, satisfy um, the the readers. But it's it's, it's fun because it's it's a way of having a community. And I feel like writing, it can be such a lonely thing 
And I, I'm an introvert anyway, but it's nice to have somebody who's kind of going through it with you who can who can give you their their take on it. Um, recently, I published a piece on the Journal of Expressive Writing, and it was like a piece of it that I wrote about anxiety and um, like medical anxiety, because that was one of my big things. And it was funny, I shared it to Facebook, I shared it to a few of my socials. And um, I, the people that responded were the people that I was so shocked. Uh, they were least likely in my mind yeah. to have anxiety. And I was like, it goes to show you, like, you never know what's going on with somebody, but it was, it was interesting. Like I, I loved getting kind of that feedback, like, oh, I've been there or this happened to me. And like one story kind of emerged, you know, um, a, a many other stories. So I found that to be like very cool. And that's what I love about it too. It's like, it opens up a channel for a concert, you know, a conversation. Those are like, those like secret things. Like you have those little side things that people don't realize and then when they see it they're like oh it's kind of like that wake-up call of like oh I never knew this about you and it's usually the people who've known you the longest because they already have this perceived uh image or notion of who you are exactly and you're kind of just like putting it out there it's like no no there's there's more most everyone has that surface knowledge right right it humanizes us too it's a, it's so humanizing to you know to to take that perspective when you never know what somebody's going through and it's it's always fun i mean i i always enjoy when people come to my shows or whatnot and like when i was first doing it my parents would come up from georgia for them so people have known my parents for a while mm-hmm. and then when i get on stage and i'm just going off talking about everything and anything from drug use to uh girls pissing my bed or something when they're too drunk or something like that (laughs) that so like after every show it is guaranteed at least one person would be like I can't believe you said that in front of your parents (laughs) yeah and your mom especially I feel like I feel like (laughs) not so much dad but mom what what would you say to you after that what would what would your parents say what was the feedback after the shows it was, it was fine. They like get look. My parents saw me in handcuffs. They saw me in the jumpsuit. Uh, they've they've seen they visited me when I was in rehab, and all, they've seen the worst at this point. It's like there's not much. Probably like the only thing we really that's still like faux pas is talking sex life. Uh, mm-hmm. That's that I don't think is ever going to change. It's no, like, I don't talk that much anyway. But I do remember with like the joking about uh, we were talking off there off. Uh, I think during the break that I've entered the gay best friend zone. I have a book where I'm like talking about, essentially talking about uh, how being bisexual is unfair because, you know, girls can suck dick and eat pussy and nobody says anything. But if I go out and I'm like, yo, man, I love pussy and I love dick. (laughs) Everyone might accept it and all that, but really deep down, everybody's like, nah, man, you gay or something like that. (laughs) It's just, and I go into it. And so, you know, my, uh, of course, after uh, the next day, I went out to dinner with my parents and my mom, my mom, and I was just, and the whole point of the joke is like, people just questioning me and all that. It's like, don't, don't worry about it. And my mom was like, I just want you to know that if you're gay, we do, we do love. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is, this is the point of the joke. Is, I, I literally said, this is what people ask me. And you just. You did it. You missed it, mom. You missed. I was gonna it. say, did she miss it? <laughs> you missed the point. Oh, that's funny. You know, she's a little five foot Colombian lady. You know, she she sometimes doesn't catch. She's not good with sarcasm sometimes. She. <laughs> <laughs> but I love yeah. the acceptance. I love the radical accept. You know, she's like whatever. She. <laughs> Man, you're like me, You're like mom. Right over the head. She's not. We're we're in the middle of we're in the middle of dinner. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, uh, at the Chinese buffet. Let's just stop. This is not the conversation to have right now. Oh, <laughs> God. You know, just like cringing to myself, just like, oh my God. That's like, funny. But, you know, and, you know, I, I grew up in a conservative household, mm-hmm. unbeknownst to me, because my parents never talked about politics or anything like that. So I never knew. It was, but, like, I would see sometimes we go visit my mom's aunt. And her husband had all these books of Ronald Reagan. And it never like clicked for me until I went to college. 
and I took like social uh, politics. And that's when I started like realizing politics and all that. I was like, oh, Reaganomics. Now I just thought that was just a word. I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't understand it, you know? Now it makes sense. Now it makes sense. It's like, uh, I don't know if this is for you. Uh, it took me a while before I learned that uh, we're millennials. I had no clue for I'm a while. I'm still denying so, it. I'm still in denial. Yeah, I'm still in denial. Like, but you know, I was, I was, I was one of those people. It's like, man, fucking millennials, just like yeah. throwing that out sometimes. I mean, it's like, <laughs> one day, this is some older guys like Tom. You, you realize you're a millennial, and I got, I got super offended. <laughs> it's just like, what? No, I'm not. It's like, no, nah, you are. And, you know, like a millennial, I opened up my phone to go check and see where the dates were. And I was like, fuck, I'm a millennial. I know. I know. This conversation is explicit because you use the word millennial. You know, I, that's I it. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I think my most uncomfortable joke that I usually get people is like, when did millennial overtake the N word as the most offensive word you can call somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the audience, sometimes people get a little like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, my god like, i don't know about that one tom is like right. oh okay, we're in new york i need to go this would kill down south this is probably right, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh my god well you know you have those but uh you know motherhood fashion getting back into writing and all that you know and uh you know you're now married was was doug your your uh prom date as well, if I remember that correctly. He was, he was. We met at a, a party at, um, I had just taken my Spanish regents and, um, and he was one of my friends was coming with his college friends and it was a bunch of Cortland guys. And yeah, and we, we broke up for a little bit when I was in Maris for about eight or nine months, I would say. But other than that, yeah, we've been married seven years and um, it's crazy. Then you get, I mean, We've been we've known each other since 2005, so nuts. Yeah. That's when we started dating. So long. <laughs> yeah. Barely remember those. <laughs> it's like I look back and like like I was telling you like everyone's having their kids and stuff like that, and it's like, well, I'm feeling feeling the age a little. I'm feeling my knees, my knees aren't operating the same. I'm getting all those <laughs> old. Uh, you know, old sicknesses and stomach problems and stuff like that. I'm like, geez, man, what happened? Where, where'd it go? <laughs> it's crazy. And I feel, I feel old. I feel old from having this child <laughs> attached you know, to me like, at all times. There's people like older and I was like, listen, it's like, fuck you. You, yeah. <laughs> you don't even <laughs> you know. know. What it's like, you don't know what it's like. It's like all these years I've been just shitting on my dad. Call, like my dad. <laughs> My dad, I pick on, I like, the famous thing is like, when we would go to church, I would poke his belly. And when he looked at me, I'd be like, I'm just checking to see how the baby's doing or something like that. Like, <laughs> I was vicious. Like, anytime somebody says, oh, you're so mean, Tom, I was like, you just see what I do to my parents. <laughs> the dad on my phone is uh, the old man. And then my mom is the midget. So, oh my God. I kind of, I, I, I think I remember this. <laughs> Probably. It's coming back to me. I got to keep them humble sometimes, you know, <laughs> as you get older and you start realizing the things is like, yeah, like, like you were saying before, it's like, I can't do the same shit I did back when I was younger. Oh, hell no. No, I, I really like, I just remember my mom's like words in my ears when I was in college and I was, I was running around, you know, drunk all the time. And, and she would be like, you know, you're poisoning yourself every time you drink the way you do oh, and I'm man. like I know right and like and my mom is like the sweetest like so easygoing so whatever but she's so, the fear for me <laughs> yeah oh yeah worse. I know it was it, it was that much more powerful and I was like oh my god I'm poisoning myself and I'm like but it's I'm having such a good time mom <laughs> you know like <laughs> does it count for something people always say my mom is like so adorable and all that it's like I don't it's like now you haven't seen the savage moments sometimes <laughs> they're like moms could be some of the most savage people like oh yeah just like the subtle way too it's like it's that cliche thing it's like i'm disappointed i'm not mad i'm disappointed that like that yeah. line. oh they oh, have like burn they have like a million 
alternate versions of that that they can just throw out there. It's like, mm-hmm. you got in that handbook yet? The mom handbook of like- I Listen, mom. I look at, I get it though now because now I'm like, oh, that's why it, it burns so much. Cause like nobody loves you as fiercely as your mother loves you. Nobody, I look, I mean, I, I, I look at my son and I'm like, don't, don't tell anybody that like, I love you the most. Like not, not your father, not anybody else, you know? <laughs> I'm like, and now that's why she has the most power and she should. <laughs> That's it. Oh man. <laughs> what was it like? Do you have it's probably a little shaky and all that. Do you have like a a Cortland moment for you that you like look back as like that encompassed my college years there? That, that encompassed. Oh, the yeah, when I climbed the statue. Like the <laughs> sign. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I was I was it, and it was like eight in the morning and I was shit faced and and I climbed the sign there's and there's pictures like you could make a flip book with all the pictures that somebody took of me just climbing I mean not very athletic or you know very um you know strong or skillful in that way anyway but but yeah of me just climbing climbing and then like laying across the statue and it being and knowing that it was like early morning and I was already gone it was Cortica of course freshman year Cortica <laughs> And I was laying across the statue. In fact, I actually, I should send it to you. I just took a picture because there was like on the sign, there was like a ball that I had to like get over before I got onto the um, the Cortland part. And I have a picture of me just like hugging the ball. And I have a picture of my son hugging a ball. And I put them side by side. And I was like, this is my twin. This, this I, I shudder to think what he will do one day when I know what I've done. You Don't know? you put like, that evil on your son there, <laughs> Right? I know I shouldn't I shouldn't but it's I, I you know I go oh my god this kid is me it's very frightening that's funny oh, fine. Yeah. That's and the Keebler Alpha beer moment too I would say was a was a shining a shining moment. <laughs> it was a shining shining example mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. how was Maris going to school and all that like I imagine completely different from Cortland Oh my God. So different. I mean, I remember walking into, of course, I'm not going to compare the classes or whatever, but I wa- remember walking mm-hmm. into a party and looking around and being like, where, where's, where's the keg? And it was a friend's house who I, who I knew from growing up. And he was like, well, we don't really do kegs here. And I was like, but, but how do you do the keg stands? Like, where, where's the keg? <laughs> and he, was like, he was like, he was like, listen, state school. That's not how we do it. That's not how we do it here. And I was like, oh, this is a little too it's a little too f- formal for me, you know. I don't the whole can thing, bottles, even if we got really crazy, but um, <laughs> yeah, it was just different. It was, you know, I, I find that no matter where you go, you're gonna find your niche, you're gonna find your people, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was definitely, I'm so glad that I had that experience at Cortland. Cortland was so humble, it was so. I don't know. It like softened me for the college experience. It got me. I was so homesick those first few months in mm. Cortland. I was I was so miserable, and and yet I was having the time of my life too. So, but when I got into Marist, I was like, ooh, like this is different. First of all, people had m- way more money. You know, I was I was like way out of my league, and and that I didn't grow up with that. But it was a different, you know, it was a different mentality. I had a friend who her father was lending his yacht to Oprah. Yeah, embarrassed you know and yeah, at I Cortland it was like yeah and at Cortland it was like oh you know do you want to get DP dough at three in the morning? you know like it, it was it was you know it was just a different if I if you brought that up at Maris it would have been like oh like it, it was I don't want to say it was snootier because it wasn't I, I I made some lifelong friends I you know I had a great time um but it was for sure it's different a completely different pi- private completely- and yeah, it's a completely different yeah. zone, different focus. A lot of us, Cortland, it, it was, I didn't know that Cortland was a party school until like my social studies teacher in high school, when he found out that I was going there, he just had like this brief moment where he's like, oh, Cortland, huh? Pretty big party school. And <laughs> that's all he said to me. I was like, oh, all right. Yeah. And then when I saw those pictures surface years later of the Cortica, where there was like a body like flying through the air. I don't know if you saw that, like a Cortica where there was like a, somebody was like thrown from a roof or there, it was like, it got so out of hand. And I was like, wow, I don't think I would have survived in that, that version of Cortland. Like I felt, I still felt like we were innocent. I don't know why. It it got (laughs) crazier. I mean, like 
one of the wildest uh, Quartico stories is probably uh, one of my roommates. Uh, you ever you ever see the show uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Oh yeah, I love that show. Okay, he got the Green Man suit, and this is when we bought the house. It's like right behind. It's it's on Tompkins, but it was right behind uh, what is the the Stone Lounge. Okay. Whatnot. Okay. So they have the outside fence area, and he goes running over there, climbing on the fence and giving people high fives. People want to take pictures with him and stuff like that. And at one point, I think he uh, dislocated his shoulder or something running around and stuff like that. But uh, no, it, it definitely got a lot crazier as uh, years have gone by. But Christine, uh, if we have reached a good ending point here for this uh, conversation, right. uh, usually at this point, I uh, let the person advertise or say whatever they want, pimp your social media or anything that you would like to uh, discuss, your blogs, whatever. So uh, I turn the floor over to you. Um, you can find me at, um, at my blog, which is CabernetAndClarity.com. Um, I know you'll like that name. <laughs> and you can also find me on, I have so many Instagrams. It's not even funny, but um, my most used one is my knitting one where I put, post some writing. It's uh, at Serenity, S-E-R-E underscore K underscore N-I-T-Y. Or you can find my poetry at unraveled.trainsofthought. And um, that's where I pretty much um, post a lot of my poems and um, little musings and, and writings on there. So. Jolly. And as always, guys, you will see uh, the links to all that <clears throat> at the bottom of the description of uh, this episode when it is up. Um, and as always, guys, if you're listening to this podcast, great. You found the podcast. Welcome. Hope you want to stay. Uh, if you could hit that like, subscribe, or whatever is available to whatever platform you're listening to this, that would be wonderful. And as always, if you want to actually interact and talk with me, you guys can hit me up on Instagram at TommyTomP88 or on Twitter at the TommyTom88. Christine, once again, it is great to have this little reconnect with you. I may awesome. have uh, an idea of a that I've been running through that I'll talk to you uh, after we're done recording. But uh, oh, as always, it's great. I hope uh, this wasn't a horrible experience for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a lot of fun. It was nice to, nice to catch up and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And guys, we'll catch you all next time. I'm Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Flip personality, you know it's I. You never see my kind. Never seen a sliver or a slice. I'm the butcher choice. Guts know I'm nice. You got beef? I got waggle with a knife. Now I'm gonna be wrapping up bodies up at night. Like Ray Charles, y'all yeah, know I'm out of sight. Now I'm gonna be slaying this cause you know I love the life. Early. Yo, you gotta read between the lines. I'm only gonna be moving when I'm read through all the signs. Johnny Mnemonic, I got an upgrade in mind. This is for the rebels and their revolutionary minds. Cybernetic linguistics, you know I'm on my mind. Prototype the new dimension, man, that shit is mine. Future is creation and creation is sublime. Make your own legend only happens with time.